Hello and welcome to episode 41 of The Garden Log with me, Ben Dark. I am a gardener. In fact, this week I got a letter addressed to Ben Dark, head gardener, which I've never had before. It was, of course, someone trying to sell me something, but that doesn't matter. Ben Dark, head gardener. Anyway, this is my podcast, and this week I am talking about some of the adventures and minor misdemeanors I have been up to in the garden this week. There is a broken axle bar on the ride on mower, some destructive hedge pruning, a bit of spraying things with milk, and a discussion of sawfly on the roses. So there you go, that's the roundup. Now you don't have to listen to the podcast. So I'll see you next week. Thank you very much and goodbye. Welcome to the week in gardening. This week began on a Tuesday, and a Tuesday is a fine day for the working week to begin on. Really, I should have embraced the extra day of indolence and come into the working week at a saunter, but I think there is some sort of nub of Puritan guilt within me that means that a long weekend means I have to try and work a bit harder in the week that follows it. So I started straight away on Tuesday with some vigorous hedge trimming. And my goodness, hedge trimming really is a vigorous activity. I am recording this now with my biceps still aching. You could sell the activity as part of a toning regime. Though I am sure that waving around my chattering, shuddering, loud metal pole with all of its belching fumes, its petrol and two-stroke, is probably taking years off my life. There was a study this week talking about the effects of air pollution on the human brain and on the intelligence of the person possessing that brain. I think if I'm going to be able to carry on doing this podcast and improvising into a microphone, then I'm going to have to switch over to battery-powered equipment fairly soon. Anyway, I got out the petrol hedge trimmers and set about the ewes that have been planted this year and the year before. How many podcasts have you heard me talking about planting a section of yew hedge? Must be 15 of them or so. Anyway, all of those hedges got their first cut back. When cutting hedges, preparation is important. The, the hedge trimmer needs to be nice and sharp and well lubricated. And the garden slightly protected. It's like if you were to decorate a wonderful, wonderful living room and finish it with a lovely deep rug from some perfumed land of the desert and then finish it all and go and shave your head in the middle of it. You wouldn't do it. Were you to want to shave your head in your living room, you would put on a bib of some sort and probably stand on a towel. My equivalent within the garden of this preparation work was to put down tarpaulin at the bottom of the hedges. The clippings are generally fine when they are to fall onto a flower bed or onto a piece of lawn. They can be blown up or just left where they are. If they're in the flower bed, they're at the back of things. No one's going to notice them. They'll rot down. You can say it's a very, very sparse mulch. If they're on a lawn, you can mow them up. If they're on a piece of hard ground, then fine, blow them, do whatever you want, rake them up. The place you really need a tarpaulin is when you are cutting a yew hedge onto a gravel path because instantly the yew works itself underneath the little stones and you can't blow it off, you can't rake it off and it looks apparent. It looks very obvious that your gardener is a slapdash fool who has learnt nothing in his many, many years in the business put down a tarpaulin over the gravel. Yew hedges are wonderfully easy to cut and they're very forgiving. So go crazy with them. You can cut really, really hard into yew. You can cut right back to that central stem if you want to. 
The effect that I'm going for is fairly formal. So I was putting on a little proto batter. And a batter is the hedge, the angle on the hedge. Where the face of the hedge reclines slightly, the base is wider than the tip. It is a pyramid of sorts. A vast long green Toblerone bar. You do this to fight the natural urge of the plant. And actually isn't that what all gardening is really? Anyway, in terms of fighting the yew, the yew wants to capture as much light as possible. To do this, it is going to grow into the archetypal tree shape with a lot of stuff up top, i.e. leaves, and very little stuff at the bottom, i.e. a trunk. And a hedge that is allowed to do that will end up looking like someone with a very trendy haircut, someone with a haircut that is shaved at the sides and a curly mass on the top. And that is the complete wrong look for hedges. I won't judge about if it's the right look for people, but for hedges, no, we are not having it. For hedges, we want something much more refined, a sort of conical head, the head you might see on a very, very intelligent professor. The wonderful thing about a batter is that you don't really notice it. It looks just like a big block of green, which is what you want your U-hedge for, but it will still have a thick base to it. There won't be any of that hollow half hedge, half cave effect that you get on the less disciplined hedge. I followed the standard hedge cutting protocol and cut in upward strokes, which means that the, the trimmings fall away beautifully from the hedge and it makes for a lovely clean cut. But when you are cutting through fairly thick stems, so you're doing the use formative prune as I was doing, sometimes it does not wash. You need to go against the grain. You need to cut down right on top of the stems in order to chop them off. So I did a little bit of that as well. It was all very Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I was wielding the hedge cutter with abandon by the end of the day. I know most of the horticultural advice says use canes and use string line and use templates. And I did none of that. I did it all by eye. And it's not because I have a great eye but because these trees haven't really formed one coherent mass yet. They are still individual units rather than one all-encompassing thing called a hedge. So you can get away with a bit more rough and ready approach to it. Having said which, I probably wouldn't use all of that stuff anyway. Once you've cut enough hedges, you sort of get a feel for it. Confidence is king, I think. The confidence to cut the head and the confidence just to lie about it if you make a mistake. Just say that bit was diseased. I had to cut that huge, great chunk out of it, right at eye level. Yes, a terrible you plague in there. So that was Tuesday. I lied my way to the end of the day fairly effectively. I'm not sure anyone's seen through me yet. On Wednesday, I took things even further, reinforcing the impression I like to give of myself as a gardening type by chatting about the weather for most of the day. It was one of those days of change. There was a slight drop in the temperature. Very noticeable. All those clouds had scurried off somewhere else, and the heat had gone up to the stars, no doubt. And so we came to work, along with all of the various tradespeople who were hanging around, and shivered and drunk cups of tea, and talked about, oh, it's lovely this time of year, isn't it? Nobody said, soon be Christmas, you'll be glad to hear. I told the builders that you could tell autumn was on the way because the peony leaves were starting to go. And the builders were supremely uninterested in the peony leaves, so I'm telling you instead. I could tell autumn was on its way because the peony leaves were starting to go. Peonies are brilliant plants, but they die in a very raggedy, uncoordinated manner some leaves going two weeks before others, all of them going in a completely different set of colours and brownings. It's not very pleasing. So on Wednesday I went and dealt with the peony beds and chopped back the, the more egregious versions of these things. I don't know if anyone chops their herbaceous peonies to the ground when there's green left in them. 
I've never done it because the leaves just seem so big. It doesn't seem right. I like to think that I can give them a chance to draw the energy back into their, their big old roots, ready for next year. The other very distinctive thing about this time of year, I find, is the, the late summer flush of growth. It's like a, a teenager who's almost done growing and then puts on that one last awkward growth spurt to take them up to full height. Here plants have done their first bit of growing and then did that frantic, frantic midsummer push for flowers and seeds. And now the flowers have gone and the seeds have either been set or have been cruelly chopped off by a deadheading gardener. Sorry, I've used the wrong analogy. Let's go back to the beginning. It's not like teenagers. It's like parents of teenagers. Parents who had a vigorous, energetic, wild and hedonistic youth, then sacrificed many years in reproduction and catering to the next generation. Then the children go off to university, the parents become empty nesters, and suddenly all of those irresponsible behaviour, all of the partner swapping and drug dabbling comes right back out again. And my roses and other plants are behaving like those parents. They have the unrestrained joy of beings who no longer have to worry about reproduction. They are throwing out leaves all over the place, the very, very dark red leaves that the roses have at this time of year. Some of them have put on about a foot in the last couple of weeks. It's very impressive and also quite sad because I'm going to chop them all off in a bit to prevent the rose from succumbing to wind rock over the winter. There's a second flush of flowers on lots of things as well. There's lots of delphiniums out again. Delphiniums that had been chopped almost back to the ground. There are a second flush of flowers on some of the red hot pokers. Very good flush, actually. It's altogether very exciting to see things that we thought were gone coming storming back into play. I did a bit of minor P&D control on Wednesday. You remember me last week talking about the box tree moth caterpillar. And in that, I compared it a lot to the sawfly and the damage the sawfly can do. And in the old rule of speak of the devil, that summoned the sawfly to the garden and they began to feast upon the roses. Sawfly don't eat that red new growth, interestingly, because they, they lay the, the eggs in slightly older wood and the eggs need time to mature alongside the stems before they burst out and eat the leaves. So all the red stuff is too new and young to get the sawfly. But the green leaves slightly behind them, the leaves from earlier in the year, have been feasted upon. I managed to take 149 sawfly of various sizes off one particular shrub, and there were similar amounts on some of the others. It's a job that I enjoy immensely for some reason. I don't know why, I find it very satisfying. Though I would prefer that all of the little birds in the garden did it for me. So that was Wednesday, a day of fiddling and thinking and roses. On Thursday, things were altogether more catastrophic. We managed to break the wheel from the ride-on mower. It was very dramatic. I wasn't on it at the time, my colleague was, but the wheel just splayed completely sideways. It wrenched itself away from the machine, whole bits of metal having come asunder. It looked like a horrendous footballing accident, something that would end a career where limbs have gone in all of the wrong directions. I think if the mower were a horse, it would be tented and shotgunned. Luckily, the mower is not a horse, it is a lawnmower, so we managed to phone up an incredibly talented mower man who came out and replaced the axle bar. And I thought he was going to be very impressed with the amount of damage that we had done to this poor machine. But actually, he says, no, it happens all the time. It's what you're going to get if you're going to mow bumpy ground. And indeed, we were mowing bumpy ground. We have been cutting the meadow down once more, almost scalping it to sow the yellow rattle. That parasitic plant, the meadow maker in chief. 
Hopefully it's going to lower the vigour of the grass so that we have more space for all of the flowering wildflowers. I had a little debate with myself this week about whether to help them along by ordering a load of wildflower seed. And it would probably be much better for my clients and the meadow that I have promised them if I did that. But I'm not going to do it because I have this strange desire to see what turns up naturally what is blowing in the air and I want to see what goes on over the years which species come first how long it takes for a particular thing to turn up which plants outcompete each other and disappear over the years or reappear I want things to be a reward to us when they come in and I want in five years time I want to be able to find my first orchid or a particular arable poppy unique to four valleys in Buckinghamshire and I want to know that it came there serendipitously. So I'm going to take the long approach and let nature take its course. I'm also very interested in which grasses turn up. I have absolutely no idea about meadow grasses. I'm okay on our ornamental grasses, on our miscanthuses and steepers and calamagrostis and things like that, but apart from a few of the classics, foxtail grasses and bent grasses, I really can't distinguish most of the, the species of poa in the, in the meadows, and I want to slowly learn about them and see how their mix changes over the coming years of meadow management. I think it's these little things that keeps one interested in a space and that keep one's friend and family fascinated in your conversation as you tell them one more time about red knuckled spindle grass. So stay tuned next year for even more stories about blades of grass. On Friday, I got a new pruning knife. It's a lovely little thing with a lovely carved wooden handle that just fits straight in the hand. And I immediately cut myself with it, which was accidental, but actually fairly symbolic, I think. It probably bonds me to this knife and gives a bit of my lifeblood to any of the cuttings that I take with it. Next week, I think, is going to be a good week for cuttings, so stay tuned for that. I'm going to take my knife off to take some semi-ripe and some softwood cuttings, even though it's not quite the time of year for them. Anyway, after I had staunched the flow of blood, I got on with some hardcore lawn business. But I won't tell you about that because nothing actually interesting happened. None of the wheels fell off the lawnmower and no interesting grasses were found in the grass collection box. I did do some gardening. I did some strange kind of gardening. I did the kind of gardening that makes you question, is this actually a hoax? I was spraying dahlias with milk solution. And I was doing this because I've heard from various people, including those great Gardener's Question Time panellists, that a solution of 50% water and 50% milk helps to combat powdery mildew. And powdery mildew is a fact of life in the late summer garden. It's something that is going to happen. With many plants, I'm quite happy to just cut them down and chuck the leaves into a bin or burn them. Some plants just naturally take to powdery mildew. Calendulas at this time of year, you'd expect it. It would be weird if they didn't have it. Likewise for some of the asters. But I had it on the dahlias, and I really want to keep these dahlias going for another month. They were only on some of the dahlias. There's a long stretch of dahlias that are planted against a wall, and these are they that have the mildew. And I think it's because they have a naturally drier soil, because they're against the wall. And plants that are dried are generally more stressed and less able to fight off the ferocious mildew. The other reason is that they're not getting any airflow from the wall side. And airflow is kryptonite to fungus. Anyway, I want these dahlias around for another month. And 
dahlias can't be left with mildewed leaves. They don't do a nice, neat, grey coating, as if they were wearing a tarnished suit of iron. They do a grey coating with horrible, blotching, blurbish things underneath. Great, big spots of yellow and brown on the leaves. It's very off-putting. So I went out there with my milk spray and doused them. I'll keep you updated on whether it works. I don't think it will, but it might halt the, the spread a little bit and mean that they are acceptable to be seen in polite society. That's, that's all I asked from them. When I was doing my PA1 and PA6, that is the Safe Application of Herbicides and Pesticides Certificates, yes, I am qualified, I didn't cover the, the milk unit, so I don't know what protective equipment might be required. I didn't wear any. I wore shorts and a t-shirt, and happily reveled in the milk spray. And when the milk was finished, I went home, for there was nothing else to do. Another week in gardening had been completed. It was a good and varied week, which is all we can ask for apart from maybe a few horticultural recommendations to see us through the next week. nebulous and slightly ad hoc recommendations this week. My first recommendation is for those of you who thought that I didn't talk enough about lawn stripes this week, the, the mower brand Allet. I use an Allet mower actually, it's very good. Allet are running their annual lawn stripe competition where they judge the best lawn stripes they are sent in by members of the public as part of their ongoing PR and marketing drive. You don't have to buy a mower to look at the pictures. There are some wonderful stripes out there. And if you like looking at mower stripes generally, then this week I've been looking a lot at the heyday of the English football stripe, which was before the Premier League banned them as a distraction that was hard to monetize. The, the football grounds were involved in something of an arms race towards the most stripy, brilliant grounds. The heyday was in about 2017, not very long ago, and I think the champion was Leicester City. They have some magnificent designs on there, so much so that I was wondering with a colleague whether they had some sort of software that you could download some sort of AutoCAD thing that would put over your your piece of grass so they could show you in which direction to walk this way and that way in order to draw a full-sized tiger. If they don't have that and anyone is technically minded, I think there's a business opportunity there, some sort of plug-in. Anyway, you can have that idea. It is released under a Creative Commons license. I've been listening to podcasts this week, as I often do. No new gardening ones. I'm sticking with the old favourites. But I've been listening to some literary podcasts. And on one of those, on the Blacklisted podcast, which is very good, actually, if, you, if you're interested in books and discussion about them, then you can listen to that. They were talking about George Orwell, and specifically his essay, The Lion and the Unicorn which I had forgotten contains one of my favourite descriptions of gardening in the entire world, and I'm going to read it to you now. Like most things with Orwell, though he's a brilliant writer, it's not something that I enjoy for the, the magnificence of the words, just for the, the prescience and the clarity of the observation. This is Orwell talking about the, the national character, and he writes, But here it is worth noting a minor English trait which is extremely well marked, though not often commented on, and that is a love of flowers. This is one of the first things one notices when one reaches England from abroad, especially if one is coming from southern Europe. Does it not contradict the English indifference to the arts? No, 
Not really, because it is found in people who have no aesthetic feeling whatsoever. What it does link up with, however, is another English characteristic, which is so much a part of us that we barely notice it, and that is the addiction to hobbies and spare time occupations. The privateness of English life. We are a nation of flower lovers, but also a nation of stamp collectors, pigeon fanciers, amateur carpenters, coupon snippers, darts players, crossword puzzle fans. All the culture that is most truly native centres around things which, even when they are communal, are not official. The pub, the football match, the back garden, the fireside, and the nice cup of tea. I think this is very true. For most people, gardening is not an artistic enterprise. It is literally a pastime. It's what we do when we are not slaving away for our boss. I think that this is at the root of a lot of those very complicated and confused debates the gardeners have about whether they are creating art or not. George Orwell himself was a very keen gardener. And I think that's why I like this this piece of work, because it is a criticism of the English and of gardeners, but a fond criticism. He was very much of the hobbyist school of gardening. I think he liked growing cabbages, and he kept hens that would no doubt have pecked around the cabbages. Another thing that Orwell has written is that the English are great lovers of flowers, gardening, and nature, but this is merely a part of their vague aspiration towards an agricultural life. What do you think, listeners? Are flowers the plaything of the bourgeois? Is gardening merely a hobby for people with no aesthetic sense? I think for me, it's been a gateway. Orwell says that one of the things that the international community would almost universally agree on is that the English are not gifted artistically. And I think I thought that about myself until I came into the world of plants and flowers and started to realise that once you know a few things, then you can make an aesthetic judgement and you can somehow say, yes, this definitively looks better than that because of this shape and of this colour and these proportions. And once one has done it with plants, then you almost start looking at paintings and architecture and even, dare I say it, fashion, and having opinions. So for me, gardening did start as a, a hobby, but I think it has led into something slightly higher. Not that it is necessarily a process that has an end point. There is no reason why it should lead to anything more than just enjoyment in plants. But it's, it's interesting to have a think about these things occasionally. And it's also interesting to read a little bit of Orwell. So there we go. Three recommendations. The Blacklisted podcast, George Orwell, who you might well have heard of, and Leicester City Football Club. I have a big order of second-hand garden history books being delivered next week. So next week's recommendations might be slightly more academic, but uh, hopefully not. Hopefully they will be even more lowbrow. And talking of lowbrow, I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Garden Log podcast. I certainly enjoyed making it, as I always do. A reminder that you can get in contact with me to say whatever you like on thegardenlogpodcast at gmail.com. You can find me on Twitter at Ben's Garden. And you can find me on Instagram at Gardener Dark. I hope you have a wonderful week and that you find time to stop in the middle of the garden and do nothing at all. Until next time, thank you and goodbye.